So I'm Kathy LeBlanc and Brandon Haas and Elizabeth Johnston and I are um, going to talk about project-based learning in the age of COVID-19. The, the name of this presentation on the schedule was um, project-based learning online and we realized as we were doing the work of putting this together that online is different now <laughs> um, and and what we want to talk about is some of the flexibility that we need to um, have if we're going to be doing project-based learning in the fall so the first thing that we want to emphasize is that we're definitely not experts on this particular subject we have all done a bunch of project-based learning we've engaged in professional development about project-based learning but I think things are really different now. So what we've, what, what we've brought, we hope to you, is the results of just spending a, a lot of time talking about this and reading about this in the last 10 days or so. Um, so what we'd like to start with is what we're calling a thought activity. We'd like you to take about two minutes and, and identify for yourself the reasons that you engage in project-based learning in your classes. What do you hope your students will gain by engaging in project-based learning? And what are your expectations for your students, yourselves, and the projects when you do this kind of work? So just take about two minutes to think about that. Okay, so now that you've thought about that, we'd like to just have a little bit of a discussion about what you, what you answered to these questions. So I, I, don't, I don't have the ability to sort of look in the chat at the moment with sharing my screen. So I think if people just wanna unmute themselves and jump in, that would work. Um, hi, it's Liz. I wrote that I hoped our students would gain um, a sense of learning through doing, a sense of tolerance for the trial and error processes, and that they would gain a group work experience, a group work experience that actually works. Excellent. So Kathy, this is Roxana. I thought this was a very good exercise in practices, in practicing self-regulating learning and kind of having the students in charge of their own learning and kind of getting the habits to, to doing that. And in terms of expectations, I think my expectation would be that they show up, kind of jump in there um, with, with full motivation, with, you know, an action attitude, and then they just do it. And, um, and I agree with everything that Liz said as well. <laughs> and I agree with everything the two of you said also. I would say those same things. Anybody else? Um, I, I can't help myself. Um, I have to jump in. I'm particularly provoked, um, not provoked, but I'm interested in, in what Liz has said. And I also want to add um, kind of uh, creativity, students recognizing their own voice, connection with their um, context, local, whatever that might mean, um, as they engage in some sort of problem. Um, so, so kind of students creating new knowledge, student agency, uh, that seems important. And so that's a kind of creative and unpredictable part that as you, the instructor, you can't anticipate it. Well, and I think that, um, you know, student creativity is really related to the stuff that Roxana was talking about with self-regulated learning as well, right? Like being able to engage and, and um, do new things because they thought of those new things. And, and I, I would connect uh, creativity yeah, to like trial and error to... as well. That's so right. Liz, Liz right. said- I'd like to add that, uh, excuse me. 
Go ahead. I'd like to add that, that students have the, um, they, they have the opportunity to um, understand different perspectives and uh, different experiences from one another. Yep, those are all really, really great things. So I'm gonna cut this off now, um, but keep these things in mind as we go through this, this conversation today. So I'm gonna refer to the same blog post that Matt referred to in his presentation about cruelty-free syllabi. Um, on Monday of this week, Kathy Davidson, who's the author of a book called The New Education and who's the founder of Haystack, which is a great online community for humanities scholars uh, wrote a blog post about remembering that when we're planning our fall uh, classes, all of our students are coming to the learning endeavor from a place of trauma that they're, they're real and as are we. And so we, we need to keep that in mind. We need to um, think about what their current situations are as we're planning our, our fall semester. I think for me, as I read this, one of the most um, profound questions that she asked is this last one, which is, what do our students need now? This is, this is the thing that we really need to be thinking about as we, as we start planning our fall, fall semesters, because we don't want to be adding to the students challenges in in life and so um the other thing that i thought was really interesting to to think about is that when for example when i talk about wanting my students to gain to gain some skills around self-regulated learning part of the way i talk about that is because in the future this is what you're going to need to you know deal with changing job situations to you know, all, for all kinds of reasons but when the future is so uncertain, um, how, what does that mean for students and how, how do we talk to them about these kinds of things? If you haven't read this blog post, I would strongly encourage you to go do that. We have the link here in our, in our slide deck, which like all the materials will be available after our session. The other thing that we found that seemed really interesting was this this particular piece of advice about uh, from ed, an edutopia article the, this particular article was geared towards teachers of younger children who were talking to parents and trying to explain the advantages of doing project-based learning online even when those those students are home but i think you know one of the things that we're going to try to do today is help us to really hone in on our core values of why we do project-based learning and, and figure out ways that we can really focus on those core values so that we kind of lower our expectations so that we're meeting those core values. And if other things happen, that's great, but if they don't, that's, that's actually okay as well. Um, and and it, the uncertainties of the fall semester mean that we're going to have to really focus on what we think is really important and, and make sure that we can do that regardless of, of where we are in, in the world in, in terms of being online face to face and all of that kind of stuff. Now I'm going to um, turn it over to Elizabeth. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, so we want to talk a little bit um, just so that we all have the same sort of starting point point for project based learning. We're going to refer to the gold standard that's from PBL works. So those first seven elements are part of that gold standard of PBL. So if any of those look unfamiliar to you or unsure about what those are, um, you'll see that there's a link at the bottom of this particular slide that will give you more information about, for example, like what does student voice and choice mean within PBL. But we're hoping that you come with some working knowledge of this gold standard, because um, we're going to use this in the next activity. Um, one thing that we added was uh, team-based collaboration. Uh, we feel like this is something that's infused in all of the PBL that's happening here at the PSU, at PSU. And so we wanted to put this in part 
as part of the gold standard because we're going to ask you to kind of think about these in our next thought activity. So in just a minute, uh, Kathy's going to share a poll, but before we share the poll, we want you to do another thinking activity. Um, and we really want you to process these gold standards. And so the first question we want you to consider is which of the gold standard essential uh, elements are most important to you? Um, and then which of the gold standard essential elements do you think are most challenging to implement online? So think of those two questions for the next two minutes. And, and actually, I don't have the ability to share the poll, so this is where Hannah or Matt is going to share the poll, but we'll give people a, a minute. I think the poll is shared. You're not going to give them a minute. <laughs> <laughs> did the poll share? It did share. Okay. Yeah, but I think they wanted to wait. But <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> that's okay. I was so excited to push the button. I don't think you can recall the poll, so um, I can end. No, but you should be able to. Happen? Everybody should be able to just kind of move it over to the side if they want to. Yeah, be able to see the slide for Let's a second. Let's do that. Move it aside even though some of you can't help yourselves and you're voting now anyway, <laughs> and I'll toss it back to Elizabeth. It's all my fault, you can blame me. No problem. This is <laughs> all about flexibility. So when you're ready, um, you can share your thinking about the most challenging gold standard element um, in terms of thinking about online, and you can submit your choice. Matt, could you tell us uh, how many people have had we a are, chance to do the poll? We are at 33 of 57, so 59%. Okay, so we'll give people a little bit more time and um, if you can in the next minute share your thinking. Just FYI, some of you students and stuff who are in here who are co-hosts in this room, um, it's not available to you, that's why. I mean, not because you're students, because you're co-hosts. <laughs> okay, Matt, if you could close the poll. Sure. And share what the group was thinking about. So it looks like um, more than half of us think that the team-based collaboration aspect is the most challenging part to implement online. I'm curious if anyone would be willing to share their thinking about that particular element. I mean, I think for me, sustained inquiry was a close second just because I'm anxious about maintaining communication channels with students with online but with team-based collaboration i clicked it so quickly and i thought this is i know this is wrong because i know team-based collaboration can happen online but there's something about um, in a project-based class or when you're working on studio time with students and you're all in the same room together i don't know maybe you guys will laugh at me but maybe it's pheromones there's something about being Okay, thank you for laughing. There's something about being in the same room where um, there's a kind of sense of immediacy. Um, and that, that's something I'm kind of anxious about with project-based learning, how to recreate that dynamism, that in the moment, oh, let me show you how to write this email, or you can get in touch with this person, or we can work on you know, answering this question, whatever. 
Yeah, to me, the, the team-based collaboration is what creates good quality in the other elements. So um, you, you would not have a high quality public product. You would not have some significant sort of critique and revision, student voice. So to me, sort of the team-based collaboration is like the, the fundamental thing that needs to be there for everything else to be successful and be authentic for the project-based learning experience. I, uh, I actually had sort of assumed by um, mid-March that I was just going to jettison a lot of the team uh, portions of, of one of my class. And once we sort of uh, uh, pivoted towards a new project that didn't require the same kinds of, of collaborative uh, teamwork, um, I would say I very nearly wrote it off um, at that point in the semester. And then um, I was surprised that by uh, late April, um, they were teaming on their own. And in fact, they were then inviting me to attend their group meetings or to dip into their um, Google Docs. They were all over the place as far as what kinds of technology they wanted to use. And they, of course, had group texts going and so on. But once they sort of understood the challenge and understood why they needed to work together, they found ways to do that that were, that were a little surprising to me. So I was going to follow up on what Scott was saying in terms of the team-based collaboration and teaching a lot of project-based classes. I feel as though that is inherently the lesson that needs to be learned and forcing, I mean, half the time the students can't find time to meet and so they're all over the place and they're doing it on chat anyway. So in a weird way, I almost see it as because it's going to be a challenge that they all recognize ahead of time that they'll actually more quickly overcome that. And so for me, I, I like, I had Abby's reaction where I like clicked it and then I was like, I thought more about it and I thought maybe actually team-based collaboration wouldn't be the hardest thing, but sustaining it over time would be the, would be the hardest because, and, and just thinking about if they get nothing else from a project-based class except how to navigate all the challenges associated with team-based collaboration, then it would be a success. <laughs> I, I should clarify too that, that some of the students in my class um, were determined to team and to and to work together and and some did not and of those who did not some still managed to do good work and to contribute to the project that we had as a class um, I think that's one of the main things is that <laughs> I think perhaps when I'm in the classroom, I sell myself this illusion that I am making everyone collaborate. And uh, that's actually not really happening, um, uh, no matter what I might think. Um, but it was even more obvious that it wasn't happening for those who were determined. And I shouldn't say determined. For those who were either unable to um, or didn't know how to or, or, for, or for whatever reason weren't motivated to, to work together closely on that part of the project. Thanks, Scott. Um, we have time for one more perspective. Does anyone want to talk about student voice and choice or the public product? Those seem to be um, higher on the list as well. Um, it's Liz here. I picked student voice and choice for this first one. Um, I don't have a lot of experience in what I think we're talking about collectively as project based learning, but um, that seems to me to be the most um, I picked it as both the most crucial and the most challenging, actually, the student voice and choice. I feel like if there's no student voice and choice and therefore sort of a lack of agency, then the rest of it seems potentially sort of limp. Um, but yeah, I guess I was just sort of unsure about how to kind of get a sense of everyone's participation in a process that was sort of visible and accessible to determine what the thing would be that, that we were gonna do. So, but again, I don't, I don't really have a lot of experience in this, so. Well, thank you all for sharing your perspectives. This will be helpful as we talk a little bit about some of the suggestions we found in our research. 
Elizabeth. So um, I've already mentioned PBL Works. They have a, they've done a lot with project-based learning, and recently they've put together a series of webinars really addressing um, this move to remote learning. Um, their focus was more on the K-12 world, but I think there's a lot that we can glean from their materials. And so they surveyed eight. 880 educators. Um, they were educators who were part of their community. Um, so they were um, already using PBL. And what bubbled to the surface, um, you can see mirrors some of the some of the ideas we've talked about. Um, keeping students engaged online, um, creating online environments that foster student independence, and then finding meaningful and relevant projects. So it's just another perspective what other educators are thinking about as they're trying to work um, with PBL online. And now Brandon's going to share the next series of slides. Great, and I think somebody started to say something. You know, Maria, I don't know if it was you. If you did, sorry to call you out if you wanted to say it. Oh, that's okay. I didn't want to interrupt, but I was thinking about the public product uh, aspect uh, when Elizabeth was given all those different variables. And just one thing that I think we probably need to keep in mind that just because we're in these really interesting, unique times with a, pan a global pandemic, that there is still a lot of existing research on various digital uh, modalities, some of it's positive, some of it's negative. Uh, and there are a lot of laws that give us benefits when we're in a classroom uh, that may not extend to these more public forums. So I guess the, the current situation we're in, I'm both excited and I'm terrified. And it's one of those that I think we should proceed, uh, you know, in these unique ways, but with caution as well, because the law moves slowly, that we want to make sure that if we have questions when we're going public with things, uh, that we get those answered before we put our students' work out there. That's my legal cap on. <laughs> Great, thanks. Um, and so thinking about where does this, our conversation today, fit within the ACE framework? Um, so we've kind of highlighted some of those key areas. And it was interesting last night, I was perusing Twitter and somebody had um, posed a question that said, students, what do you want professors to keep doing, start doing, or stop doing um, if we remain online in the fall? And, you know, there was just, an immense number of responses from students and so many of them, you know, I could pinpoint where they fell on this framework. So I thought it was, it was really timely. Um, and I shared it. I think I actually saw that Liz all shared it as well. So it, it is out there on Twitter if you want to take a look at that. But so some of the key things that we wanted to address, you know, with the ACE framework and how it fits into project based learning. Um, first and foremost, you know, we've mentioned it a couple of times is the idea of trauma informed teaching. Right, our students are no longer untouched by trauma, and neither are we. Um, and so we need to really kind of be mindful of that and come at this from, you know, a humanizing approach and like humanizing the pedagogy, taking time to cultivate relationships. If we end up, you know, we're hoping to come back face to face, so hopefully that would give us some time to do that with students, you know, in the classroom. So, you know, the pheromones are, are there and we can make those connections. But if not, we've got to figure out a way to do that online and which can certainly be done, that community building, but it does certainly take a little bit more work. Um, and so finding ways as quick as you can to acknowledge and build on student strengths, consider where they're coming from and think about like culturally sustaining pedagogy. Um, and then some of those things link directly to those gold standards um, that we were talking about and that are, you know, you can check the link or you'll see them again here in just a few minutes. But, you know, the um student design and choice you know is equal you know to the voice and choice um but the idea of reduced disposability really kind of lends itself to authenticity um and linking to context and i know robin and Kristen are talking about that tonight and that'll be about three hours into the happy hour session so it could be a really interesting session to attend um i could go on and on about this but I, but we can for time's sake we'll keep going So in thinking about what this looks like in HyFlex, um, we put up a kind of a framework from High Tech High's Graduate School of Education. 
um, and their PBL design kit. And so one of the things we wanted to, again, give you a, a little bit of time to a couple minutes to think this through. Can you think of the pro a project in your class in terms of these different phases um, or different elements? And then in thinking about that, how might you migrate from face-to-face -face implementation to an online implementation for each of these different pieces? So we'll take just a couple minutes to think about that and then we'll let people share some of their thinking. So as I noted in the chat, I sometimes have a tendency to jump over the notes that I take for myself and jump right to, you know, the activity part of it. Um, and so a couple of things with this that I'll elaborate on, and I apologize for that, um, is thinking about that, you know, what does that module based course design look like? You know, and some of your courses might have modules that have to be in a certain order and that, um, you know, we talked about that, I believe yesterday with Robin and Martha and thinking about, you know, the sequencing um, versus courses that might be a lot more flexible and it doesn't necessarily matter what order they come in. And so for me, I teach a course in cultural diversity. Um, my first module would be on identity and that needs to be first, but pretty much the rest of my semester I could do in any order. And so thinking about, can you do that with an entire course? Are there sections of your course that might be able to do that um, so that it can be more flexible for students? And then being able to reorder things for students and some of that might lend itself to are there portions that really need to be face to face. And so if you know we're face to face early on, you do those up front, despite the fact that they may have typically come later on, um, if that works based on your design. So now we're happy to hear from people about how you might, how you think about some of these things and how you might migrate from face-to-face -face implementation um, to online implementation in any of these. So Brandon, while I was thinking about it, and I don't know if they were imposing in order of these Brady Bunch squares or whatnot, but what I was trying to think through is what could be done asynchronous, what could be done synchronous online, and then if there was absolutely something that needed to be in person, face-to-face. -face. And I'm actually even pulling back on that face-to-face -face option because I think we can all figure it out and go on the fly face-to-face, -face, but really trying to think if I was pushed to do all these things online, asynchronous versus synchronous. And I think I started thinking, okay, like project launch, that could be something where I provide a video so it could be asynchronous and there might actually be benefits to that because then the students can absorb it, they can replay it, they can, you know, really think about it, muddle through it more. Sometimes I feel like I personally will go over things too fast and I end up having to say them 18 times anyway. So maybe that could be a benefit. And then having the ideation aspect of things could really be a synchronous brainstorming session. Whereas things like drafting and revision is again asynchronous. You can post them up on Teams. And if you're looking for feedback from 
the entire group or just a sub team, they can do it there at their own timeline. And then you can come back together synchronous and discuss some of the highlights from that. And then that could lead to a reflection part that's also asynchronous. Um, so I guess I was trying to think of all those different phases, what could be live and what could be sort of in between as I went through. Although I don't know what core academic skills is referring to. Aren't they all core academic skills? <laughs> yeah, and this is certainly geared towards, um, you know, high tech high is a, a K-12 um, group of schools. And so they're gonna be probably approaching it with through that lens a little bit more so than we would. Um, and I, I think you're right, that. like, go ahead, Kathy. I think when you go and click on that link, they're, they're talking about things like if there's content that, that the students need to learn about and um, if there's writing instruction that needs to happen um, before they can get to drafting and revision. So I think that's the kind of stuff they're talking about with core academic skills. And I highly recommend anybody go to this link um, because they have a full-blown toolkit that you can download and can really help you kind of map things out. And I think that would really help getting at some of those things that you were talking about, Amy, that, you know, what could I switch to be, you know, asynchronous or it doesn't need to be synchronous. So I think that's a, a really important point. So Other thoughts that came to mind? Can I, can I add sort of my experience? So this is, this was one of the mistakes that I have made. Because I, I assume that the drafting and revision and kind of critique, they can all take place asynchronously and only to find out that they, they didn't lead to anything good until we did it face to face in a Zoom. So I'm almost thinking shifting in the fall, try different things and see what works with that group of, of students. It may, it may have just been these students. Roxana, was that the students in the class didn't chime in? Because I've, I've found that even face-to-face -face where you really have to prod them and sort of teach them how to give feedback and go walk through it together. So, or was it just, yeah, I guess it was of them. No, they did the revision and the revision wasn't good. So it, it was just like- <laughs> That happens face-to-face -to -face too. <laughs> right, yeah, exactly. But it was funny because when we had the, the Zoom session, I pretty much said the same things that I said, you know, that I typed in and they were all like, oh yeah, I get it now. And it's like it's the same thing I said. And it would, I thought it would have been easier if it's typed and they can see it and they can revisit it and they can reflect on it. And that wasn't the case, but I wonder if it was more, I don't know, they were all there kind of actively listening. It was kind of a different dynamic. I don't know what it was. So I've done something where I've even videoed feedback like this past semester, not with writing, but I did a GIS class and was all online once we switched over. And, but even before that, I was taking their assignments and I was actually just doing a screencast and videoing to do a commentary. And I got pretty quick feedback that that was way more compelling than writing it up and giving whatever. So maybe that's, a, that's an option too for pursuing is actively going through. Cause so much, especially in, in writing, you know, you're trying to say, okay, you want to move this here and think about the organization. And it's so hard to document that in 2D. So maybe that's another way we can pull it off. Oh yeah, that's a good Yeah, one. and for, so for time, um, cause I know we've got, I don't want to cut off anybody else's. We'll have a few minutes at the end to, to circle back because I think we're hitting on a couple of really important things that, that really come down to, for me, what I'm hearing is structure for students. And so by creating that structure for an online space, it might actually help us to see where maybe we skip over things because once we put it in writing, um, you know, we can see, oh, this isn't clear where we see it. So we wanted to touch on just a couple of the best practices and um, some of the key points of these. And then, like I said, we'll have a few minutes at the end where we can hopefully dive into a little more conversation. So these, the first um, best practice that we wanted to touch on, and we're not gonna go through all of these, but would be communication. It's something that we've heard a lot. And again, it's all about that relationship. So we need, you need to make sure that communication is early and often um, and multi, multimodal, but consistent. So things that if you're part of um, 
you know, the work through the collab, you know, that you're getting information in a variety of ways, but it's very clear what channels, where things are coming from. You want to make sure that for students, they know exactly where their information is going to be coming from. So if you're using Moodle and you're using email or you're using Moodle and Teams, for example, um, take time and engage students in some of that work. So, you know, my, maybe in an exercise in that team charter uh, building so that they can have, again, that voice within the classroom so that they know what's coming um, and where information is coming from. Feedback, again, early and often. Um, and, you know, especially with project-based learning, students have to hear from you and that feedback has to be actionable. You know, what exactly can they do better, do differently, need to think about that maybe they're missing and that they don't know that they don't know. Um, and so also consider different ways that you might give feedback. Amy just mentioned, um, you know, creating videos and said that was something I had written down to maybe screencast as you give feedback, because in addition to changing up the modality of that feedback, it also gives them another chance to hear your voice, which can kind of keep that communication and that connection really um, going throughout the course and the project. And then virtual spaces. Um, and this is really kind of an important one. It really kind of runs through a lot of the things we've talked about. So figuring out what virtual spaces are you going to use. So for us, you know, um, Office 365 Tools and Moodle are our official channels. Students might choose other ones. They might prefer Google Docs, or I know some people at other universities use Slack with their students. Um, but setting up those virtual spaces that students are going to be able to operate in, and then taking time to make sure that they can access them and that they know how to use them so that if we are gonna continue that collaboration element um, within the project-based learning, which is crucial as we've all noted, um, they know how to do that. And they could maybe do that synchronously or asynchronously, but they have the tools to do that. And then being flexible with that, making sure that you're mindful of what students, how they're gonna have access, if they have access, and knowing they might not use things exactly the way that you planned on them using it, but that's not necessarily a, a bad thing. So we're going to skip over the um, other best practices and when you have the slide deck you can go into those more in more detail for yourself. So I want to leave you with some general tips to think about and I think a lot of these have already been articulated within this session but then also kind of have been a thread throughout um, all the sessions that we've been able to participate. Um, so these these bullet points lead with compassion and care, be mindful of family situations and stressors and provide as much voice and choice as possible for students. I think they all connect to this idea of really trying to think about um, the uniqueness of this particular situation and how we can best support students in thinking about the different challenges that they might face. And then um, we want to leave you with a couple more resources um, so that you can explore more. As we mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, we think this is a starting place for your thinking about moving to P your PBL online or remote learning. Um, so these resources here um, can give you some additional information. I know the last resource, there was some conversation in the chat about um, trauma-informed teaching. Uh, so if you're interested in that, um, PBL Works had a recent article thinking about it in terms of what, what's happening right now that you might find of interest. I think we have um, a little bit time left yep, to see if, uh, if there's any left. further questions or ideas that the group wanted to share with each other before we finished up today. I kind of just want to go back to something that um, got stuck in my brain yesterday, and that was ways of sharing with each other. And I think that we might have a really great opportunity for the fall, and especially over the summer, to start developing a joint project um, that could be a module that gets unpacked by multiple professors in different classes that really promotes the interdisciplinarity and having it be offered. So it's sort of like this wrap package that when you need it, you could 
unwrap it and be like, yeah, it's Christmas in September. That's fantastic. But I, I think, you know, yesterday I left trying to think of all these different threads and what could go into tackling Wicked Problem all the way up to an ink cap and with the majors classes in between. And so I'd be really interested in, in you know, continuing that conversation with folks and trying to set up a project-based module that could tap into a whole bunch of different disciplines would be really, really neat. Later on at, I don't know what time, um, 8.35 p.m., we're having that session on tying curriculum to the real world, which is really actually about COVID, you know, um, what role COVID might play in your curriculum for fall. But one thing that I've been noticing is lots of people talking about projects they were doing suddenly became projects related to COVID because everything ended up getting shifted by COVID. And I wonder if one thing we want to do for fall is create some kind of space for COVID related projects to talk to each other. Um, I think I read about, maybe Martha would know about this, but some university that's actually really going full force on that architecture for, for fall. Um, and we may, I, I mean, I can say that I don't think we have the bandwidth to mount something super elaborate, but we could create some infrastructure to link all of this if we talked with TWP, if we talked with NCAP, and then if we just built a, a place, um, we can absolutely continue this conversation at that session, um, but it seems doable and maybe it could hook in with something modular so that people could create portions of their curriculum that would intentionally speak to that. It seems like if we had a little team and designed a kind of overarching wicked problem kind of, you know, top level, people could find their own paths to plug into it, maybe. Oh yeah, Martha put a thing in the chat, which I think is the, she probably told me about that. Um, I didn't tell you about it, but it's doing. my former institution. So yeah, that's how I know about it. Well, I just want to thank, say thank you to this uh, team very, very much and remind folks, especially some of you TWP folks who I know have a lot of challenges in working out that course um, for fall to take advantage of the drop-in hours and also that I'm sure this team in particular will be engaged also with the uh, cluster pedagogy learning community as they deal with TWP and NCAP and all of that stuff. So um, I, will, I will add, Robin, that the, yeah. the TWP steering committee um, yesterday started thinking about what we're going to do in the CPLC on June 9th. And one of the things we talked about was starting to develop a set of modules that would be useful for TWP instructors, but pretty much for anybody about things like self-regulated learning and you know stuff like that. So um, we're, we, we, it's in the planning stages. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so with that, I'm gonna stop the recording on this session.